Okay, so the second talk of today is by Balash Segedi, uh, and the title is Limits of Dense Graphs. It's a continuation of Lati Lovas's lecture. Thank you very much for coming to this summer school. This is a con continuation of Lati's lecture. I will, I will use some of the notation, but actually I will review most of the important ones. Uh, so the first first notation that I use is the notion of a graphon. So in general, we have a probability space. It doesn't have to be a standard probability space. It can have atoms even, but it should be a separable probability space. And a graph one is a two-variable function on this probability space. Okay, so can you hear me better now? So we restrict the values to this zero of an interval, and of course we assume that W is measurable. Secondly, we assume that W is symmetric in the two coordinates. Um, associated to such a graphon, we can define subgraph densities. As Lotzi mentioned, graphons are infinite analogies of finite graphs, and in a finite graph we can compute, for example, the triangle density or the density for a fixed graph. Now this we can do the same thing we can do with a graphon. So the density of a finite graph H in a graphon, so this is a finite graph, and we will assume just for the notation that the vertex set is labeled by the first 10 natural numbers. So, so this is equal to an integral where we introduce an independent variable for each uh, vertex of H. And then we take this product over all edges in H, where the product, we take the product of W of Xi and Xj. Now, since W is symmetric, it doesn't matter in which order we write this. So, uh, So this is the infinite analogy of the subgraph density. Uh, at this point, I have to mention that every finite graph can be represented that way. If you put the uniform distribution on the vertices, so that's the probability space. Uh, mu is the uniform distribution. Omega is a finite probability space. And W is just the adjacency matrix of a graph then this quantity is nothing but really the subgraph density. The probability that the random map uh, from the vertices of H to the vertices of this W uh, preserves edges. Edges go to edges. And that matches the intuitive meaning of subgraph density. So this is really a generalization of subgraph density. And it has the following nice algebraic properties. Uh, T, H1, H2, if you take the disjoint union of two graphs, this is really just the product of the two subgraph densities. This is a nice property. Second property is very simple. 
if you take the single point and you look at the density of that in W, this is just one. So there you see an empty, empty product, which is defined to be just one, and then you integrate one. So you get one. And actually there is a third property, I need some more uh, notation for this third property, which is called reflection positivity. And the nice fact, I, I will come back to this, so this is the most technical one. Uh, but the nice fact is that actually uh, it turns out, it's a theorem, we proved it lots, that these three inequalities actually characterize subgraph densities in, in graphons. So if a, a graph parameter TH satisfies all these three uh, properties, then there is a graphon such that the graph parameter is just the, sub, is just the density of, of any given graph in this W. Every W gives you a graph parameter when you calculate densities of graphs. Uh, there is a very useful analogy, by the way, with, with uh, just random variables. Random variables. So the remark is that what is a random variable? A random variable is nothing but a function uh, on, a, on a probability space. So it's a one variable function. And if you have such a, a random variable, then it's very useful to calculate uh, the expectation of the nth power. So these are the moments. And you can actually view these integrals as generalized moments. So if this is a two-variable analogy of a random variable, uh, especially if you put extra powers here above W, then it's really a, a direct generalization of, of a moment into the two-variable setting. And I will, I will bring up this analogy later on, because it, it's, re, it's really it's an, it's a, it's a useful analogy. So, um, it's also very useful to, uh, to define a, a localized version of these subgraph densities uh, that we call restricted homomorphism densities. And it is denoted by T, X1, X2, Xm, W, sorry, HW. M is some number which is at most N. And this is just the same integral, but we don't integrate uh, out those variables, the first N variables. We just integrate over Xm plus 1. Uh, xn plus 2 and so on, up to xn. But we take the same integral. If, if you don't integrate uh, those variables, then you, those become actually variables of the subgraph density. So what is the intuitive meaning of that? Uh, okay, so here is a graph. You can co compute the triangle density, which is a number. But you can localize it, and you can, you can ask what is the density of triangles where one point is actually nailed here at a given point. And that's a restricted triangle density. Now this is a much, it's a richer information. It's a function on the vertices. If you, integ if you take the expectation of that function, then it returns triangle density, so it's, it's, it's indeed richer information. Okay. Um, now here comes the notion of a quantum graph. Sorry about this, that the beginning of my talk is a little bit dry, but I need to do this, so I have to introduce some notation. Uh, quantum graphs. It turns out to be a useful technical uh, definition. A quantum graph is just a finite formal linear combination of graphs, of finite graphs. So, formal linear combination 
of finite graphs. So, for example, one half triangle plus ten times the edge and minus the point. Okay, um, what we do is that we extend both uh, the subgraph density and the restricted subgraph density to quantum graphs. It's, it's really like when you take formal linear combinations, it's something similar to a group algebra, right? There you also take formal linear combination of group elements, and actually it gives a similar advantage. Very, very, very similar advantage. Um, so the density of a quantum graph in W is just, uh, so if Q is this formal linear combination, then this is just equal to this linear extension of the restricted, of, of the homomorphism density. And similarly, you do, you do the same thing for restricted homomorphic densities as well. So same thing. Um, now, I am actually ready to define what reflection positivity is, almost, not quite. One more definition. Um, let GK be the set of finite graphs in which K points are labeled by the first K natural number. Okay, these thing points, the vertices, are labeled by this set. First k natural numbers. A good feature about this uh, labeled set of finite graphs is that there is a natural commutative multiplication, which is the gluing. Commutative operation. Gluing along labeled points. Here is an example. Instead of formalizing this, I just show what it means. One, two, this point is not labeled. Here is say one, two, and some, let's say an edge, so this is the other graph. So the operation is just this triangle, this edge, and we preserve the labels. Okay? It's a commuta, obviously a commutative, very simple operation on these labeled graphs. And again, now you can take the, this is a semigroup, and you can take the, again, formal linear combinations of such uh, labeled graphs, like R, GK, again, quantum versions, okay? It's, it's now really at the analogy of the group algebra because you have this operation and you can extend that distributively to this set. And uh, now we have a nice algebra. It's an algebra over R. So um, now here comes the definition of reflection positivity. Uh, for every k, and the quantum graph in the R G K uh, we take the square of Q and then 
there is this type of bracket that we are using papers. It's removing the labels then. It's just because Q squared is still a labeled graph, but we formally remove the labels. And then we calculate the density of this square uh, in, uh, in W. And this has to be a non-negative number for, for every such situation. If this holds, then we say that T is reflection positive. Um, this is kind of analogous to the so-called moment problem for a random variable. You can take moments are forming a semi-group with respect to addition. What is a moment? It's just a natural number, right, of a random variable. Natural numbers are forming a semi-group with respect to addition. What if you take the, the, uh, the algebra over this semi-group? You get just polynomials. Okay, you can you can you can uh, examine poly, uh, polynomials of moments. So now the classical moment problem uh, says that if you have a square, a polynomial which is a square, and you uh, you you have a you have a sequence uh, like a function on n uh, to the real numbers. So I assume that somebody gives you a sequence of moments and you want to. Uh, decide whether this is the moment sequence of a random variable, right? This is the moment problem. Sorry, didn't mention that. Uh, so is this a moment? Now you can extend this linear functional to, to the space of polynomials. Space of polynomials is just this formal thing. And if this linear extension takes uh, no negative numbers on squares of polynomials, then it turns out to be a moment sequence. And this is a characterization. Now, this uh, statement about uh, homomorphism densities is a generalization of the moment problem to, to graphons. OK, uh, and, and the nice thing about this reflection positivity is that it allows you to prove various inequalities between subgraph densities, and that will be one of the main topics that I will investigate today. But now I, I actually introduce more notation, even more notation. Uh, Nazi defined the cat norm, but I defined it again. You reduce multiple edges to a single edge. That's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Here we don't consider multiple edges. Uh, there is another model in which we do. So the cat norm, as Nazi introduced, the subframum over all pairs of measurable sets of the absolute value of the integral of W on S cross T. And there is the familiar L1 norm, which is just the integral of absolute value of W. And it's obvious that the L1 norm is an upper bound for the square norm. So how should we intuitively think about the square norm? There is this story that I really enjoy telling. Assume that you want to compare pictures. And you want to, here is a picture, say here is a nice landscape, here is a tree. These are black and white pictures. Here is a somewhat similar picture. The sun is here, or whatever. Uh, you want to compare pictures. Pictures, but these are black and white pictures, and maybe this this part is gray. Since you have only black and white picture pixels, you represent these gray areas by uh, sort of patterns that look gray together. So, if you want to measure similarity between these pictures, which matches the intuitive meaning of similarity, like when you look at the two pictures from a distance, from far away, and when, when do you see them similar? The L1 distance is not really good. You can see that by, by just looking at two totally gray pictures. Two totally gray pictures, let, let's assume that we generated them randomly. Two random uh, pictures, both look gray from a distance. But uh, there is a positive, like uh, there is probability one half 
that uh, at, at the, the value of a pixel uh, will be different. So here it is zero, and here it is one. So with probability one half, if you subtract the two things from each other on half of the points, you will see uh, a difference. So, so the L1 distance is one half, basically. So they are far. Almost like the, the furthest possible is L1 distance one. On the other hand, if you look at the cut distance, they are very similar. They are very close to each other. So, so somehow this cut distance is, is a good thing. It really, may, it, it really captures something, something big. Good. So, so now, uh, another technical notation. Assume that phi on omega is a measure-preserving transformation. Measure-preserving is a measurable map such that uh, the inverse applied to any measurable set has the same measure as the set. If you have such a function, then we define the action of, of it on graphons, and in a very natural way, this is just this graphon, which obviously is a graphonic symmetry and measurable again. So with this, we define now uh, a metric or, or, or a certain pseudo distance that a square on the space of graphons on omega. which is the infimum over all measure-preserving, all pairs of measure-preserving transformations uh, the infimum of mu phi minus w psi and you take the cut uh, norm of that difference. Uh, I say that it, uh, it's not, it's, it's almost, it's, it's obviously satisfies the triangle inequality since this is a norm. I mean, these things can be easily checked. But, but unfortunately, there are uh, uh, measurable functions that are formally different, but they have, uh, they have a zero distance. That, that's an interesting issue. And uh, that we similarly define the same distance for everything is the same, but we use the L1 norm. And uh, a lemma, which is very useful, a relationship between these two distances, and I give it to you as an exercise because the proof is, is ki kind of boring. It's not very hard, but it's, it's boring. It's a it's half a page of calculation. Uh, there is an idea in it, though. Uh, it says that Delta one is lower semi-continuous in delta square. So what does that mean? That means that if you have a sequence U1, U2, U2 and so on converging to U in the delta square and W1, W2, blah, blah, converging in delta square uh, to W, then delta 1 uh, UW is at most uh, lim inf uh, of the distances of P of the members. So this is the meaning of lower, lower semi-continuity. It's a nice analytic fact and extremely useful in graph limit theory. And it has a beautiful consequence, which leads to a beautiful definition. The beautiful consequence is this. If delta square mu, this is a corollary, 
is zero, then it implies that delta one of u w is zero. And actually, the other implication is trivial because the L1 distance is an upper bound for the delta for the for the cat no, the, the, the L1 norm is an upper bound for the cat norm. So actually, we have this equivalence thing, which is absolutely non-trivial, since delta one is not continuous in that sphere. It will lead to a beautiful definition, uh, but how do we see this corollary? We need still a little argument. So the argument is this. Uh, so W1, W2, sorry, I take, uh, no, I take U, and I take a sequence of phi's such that this convert this to W in that of square. And I take the constant sequence here. Um, now, I forgot to say something. So here, in this infimum, uh, you can actually take the same infimum about just one measure preserving transformation, and it will be the same, like that. Um, if these measure preserving transformations are invertible, then this would be a trivial statement. There is some technical issue since measure preserving transformations are not always invertible, but nevertheless, it's really, a, 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 again, a technical thing, a boring technical thing. But provided uh, this, uh, there is a sequence of measure preserving transformations because of this, such that this converted to W. Uh, now, if you analyze uh, this limit, at each coordinate, it is just zero, because it's u and u with a measure preserving transformation. So at each coordinate, we have delta 1 equals to zero. So then, from lower semi-continuity, we get that here the delta 1 is at most zero, but it's at least zero, so this is zero. Okay? Very good thing, because then, and now I tell you the, the, the punchline here. There is really a punchline. Uh, <laughs> So here is the space of graphons, which is calligraphic W space. Space of graph space of graphons. And now uh, these two things are really the same, whether they have zero distance in the cut norm or in the in the in the cut metric or in the delta one or pseudometric. So we actually take equivalence classes of according to this equivalence relation. So the delta one distance or the delta square is zero. This is the same thing. And then, uh, so W by this is what we call the graph limit space, x. And now on this space x, both delta one and delta square is an actual metric. So we have this geometric triple, x delta square delta 1. And this is actually the beginning of graph limit theory. This is how I would define graph limit theory. We have this metric triple, x delta square delta 1, a space, a compact space equipped with two metrics. Both are metrics. Uh, it is compact in delta square. It is not compact in delta 1. But, but somehow the interplay between the two different metrics leads to very interesting, uh, like uh, it leads to, uh, uh, I think, the graph to, 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 to statements in graph limits here. Uh, but so, so both metrics are used and they are very important. I could use delta 2, which, is, which comes from delta 2 metric, but these are equivalent. So, so, so in some applications, I, I change delta 1 to delta 2, but that's not a significant difference. This is a significant difference. And so this, this fact that the theorem that x delta square is compact, just to illustrate that it's a powerful theorem, it has various consequences. And this is, this is basically the, the, the starting point of graph limit theory. It has various consequences. Summary this regularity lemma. Uh, 
uh, is a consequence, even in a stronger form. So the, the strong regularity lemma by Alon and Shapira. And the third consequence is in so-called Aldous Hoover, Hoover theorem on exchangeable arrays of random variables. So this is a joint generalization of, of all these things and, and, and perhaps other things. And uh, so there is this theorem that convergent uh, graph sequences have a limit in the form of a graphon, but that theorem is not equivalent with this. This is a much stronger theorem because it also implies uh, all these regularity lemmas, and so this is really the theorem that we use in graph limit theory, not just the fact that convergent sequences have a limit. And actually, the, 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 the proof that I sketched yesterday is the proof of this theorem. Uh, of this compactness. Okay, so this is this is graph. Uh, this is the abstract, let's say, boring formal background in graph limit theory. But now I want to tell you about uh, more exciting stuff. Let's go back to this subgraph densities of graphs and quantum graphs. So it is true that remark is that if two uh, graphons are equivalent, uh, can be this means that delta square of u and w is the same as delta one u w zero. So this is my equivalence. It's called weak isomorphism. Now this weak isomorphism has this simple implication that the density of any graph in U is the same as the density of any graph in W. So basically what does it mean? It means that my subgraph densities extend or can be well defined on this factor space X. So what we have is that here is this graph limit space X. And each subgraph density, if you fix a graph H, uh, so W, the equivalence class of W goes to T H W. So these are real valued functions. These are well defined, these are continuous, by the way. Also, there is a continuity here. Uh, and by the way, these functions are forming a separating set any two points of the graph limit space can be separated by such a function. So the stone wire stress theorem implies that if you take formal polynomials of such uh, subgraph density functions, then this is a dense set in, in the continuous functions on the graph limit space. But what are, formal, what are, what are polynomials in, in subgraph densities? These are just densities of quantum graphs. So if you look at a density of, so more generally, I could say that I also look at densities of quantum graphs, which are functions. And these functions are forming a function algebra on the graph limit space. And I consider this function algebra as an analogy of classical polynomial functions. And I try to exploit this analogy. So these are my polynomial functions on the graph limit space. Sorry? Oh, very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you take uh, <laughs> the, the following reason because if you take two disjoint edges, then that's the uh, and, yeah, very good question. So so this this is very important. Uh, but the dis the, my remark about the disjoint union helps. Good. So now I have this, poly, this polynomials in the graph limit space, and I want to exploit this analogy between form between classical polynomials and subgraph densities. I, I, I want to use similar language. So, so philosophy uh, these functions w map to TQW on the, on, 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 gra on the graph limit space are considered as polynomials. 
You can play with this analogy, but you will see that it's not a perfect analogy. Uh, but nevertheless, I will, I will, I will ask a similar question as you can ask about polynomials. So, so if you have polynomials, it's very in a, on a space, then it's very natural to consider algebraic and semi-algebraic sets. So. So in graph limit theory, so on, on the left side I will focus on graph limit theory, on the right side I will focus on extrema combinator. Because I will compare uh, these, uh, these the notions with polynomials with, with things in extrema combinatorics, because after all I want to use graph limit theory in, 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 in combinatorics. So first of all, I say that a subset, uh, a subset in the graph limit space is algebraic if it can be defined defined by finitely many polynomial equations. And similarly, I call a set semi-algebraic if it's uh, defined by finitely many polynomial inequalities. Sometimes it's for semi-algebraic sets, uh, people allow finite union as well. So, uh, but actually the algebraic sets are even more interesting. Semi-algebraic sets are also interesting. So what does it correspond to in extremal combinatorics? Uh, for example, what is a semi-algebraic set? I say that the edge density is in W, a very, very simple set, is, is, is one half. I restrict my I restrict my attention to just to those graphons where the edge density is one half, and then I can ask uh, what is the possible structure. I mean that's a very boring question, but then I can I can add another equation like the triangle density in W is say zero. So now this my set is defined by 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 two equations. So what can be a graphon? in this set. And it turns out, by the way, in this setting, a uh, very uh, nice fact, that these two uh, polynomial equations restrict your W to just one possible choice in X, a single point. This will be a single point algebraic set. This you have to appreciate because most graphons cannot be obtained this way. I will come back to this issue. So W is weakly isomorphic to this two variable function. And believe it or not, this is just two run theorem on triangles from extremal combinatorics. So this is basically saying that if the edge density is one half and the triangle density is zero, then your graph is a complete bipartite graph with equal color in a finite setting. So that. If you study here algebraic and semi-algebraic sets, this translates into structural questions in extremal combinatorics. What is the structure of a graph uh, with, a, with given restrictions, with given uh, uh, algebraic restrictions? You, you, you may formulate it in a way that the edge density is two-thirds and the triangle density is the minimal possible value. And then what is the structure of the graph, right? That's also a meaningful question. But again, I restrict, uh, again, it's an algebraic set. So this translates into structural problems in extremal combinatorics. Now, there is an, another natural question that you can uh, investigate using polynomials. And this is the, the question of projections. What's your dimension that? It goes in a slightly different direction. 
if you fix a finite set of graphs, you can also fix quantum graphs, but let's for now let's just stick with graphs. Uh, H1, H2, HK is a finite set of graphs. Then they together define a map from the graph limit space to R to the K. So using this, I have a map from X to R to the K. And actually, in fact, it's in the unit cube uh, because I map a W to just the vector TH1 in W, TH2 in W, and so on, THK in W. Okay? Uh, actually, uh, this goes to the unit Q, the K dimensional Q, because the subgraph densities are between 0 and 1. Now, this is a continuous function. This is a compact space, by the way. The image has to be a compact subset in the unit Q. So we, that's, that I call the projection. So the image, uh, so, so the image of F is the projection. That, that is the set that I want to understand. Why? The reason why I want to understand it because it encodes all possible inequalities between these subgraph densities. It, it encodes so much combinatorial information about inequalities uh, that it's a very useful set to study. It, 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 it summarizes all the inequalities into a, into a nice topological picture. Uh, so this is uh, really about, this tells you about inequalities between subgraph densities. So let me, let me give you a very concrete example. Here, here there is a beautiful success story, which was uh, a result of many decades of research, and actually the final result used the graph limit theory. And this is a very simple projection, namely uh, W goes to uh, the edge density and the triangle density in W. So it's uh, a subset, the image of this projection is a subset of the unit square, so I can even draw pictures, it's very nice, I will draw a much bigger picture, no? This is the unit square. It has absolutely nothing to do with the unit square on which a graph on is defined. It's a very different unit square. It could be a three-dimensional stuff, I projected it. Three variables. On this diagram, every graph is represented by a single point. And if I look at uh, the, the, just the points represented by finite graphs, that's quantitatively many points. It will be a very fuzzy thing. Quantitatively many points. But if you take the closure of those quantitatively many points, then you get actually a nice shape. And uh, if you understand that shape, then you understand all possible inequalities between the edge density and the triangle density. Because uh, honestly, you cannot get every pair. Uh, if the edge density is zero, then the triangle density cannot be, for example, one half, right? <laughs> Obviously. So what is this shape? Let me start drawing. So this axis is the edge density in W, and this axis is the triangle density in W. So first of all, there is a theorem by Krushkal and Katona, which implies that this upper curve is y equals to x to the 1.5. So everything is below this curve. This is an order theorem. Now here is, at one point, one half, there is the Turan theorem that I mentioned. Uh, we, actually, it says, the Turan theorem also says that if, if the triangle density is, so a graphon is the pre-image of this point, then it's a unique graphon. And, uh, and, uh, and if the triangle density, or the edge density is bigger than that, 
then there is this lower curve, which is 2x squared minus x. This is a quadratic curve. And this is the so-called Goodman bound. And everything is above that. So what is the truth? It could be that, that this is the closure, the, two, the, 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 the region between the two. But then a fine issue came up, a very disturbing thing, that there, that, that there are certain little parts here which cannot occur again. So above, if you look at this curve, and you look at the next is two-third, this is, this is fine. So two-third, the point on this curve above two-third is actually is a good point, it is, is in the projection. If you look at the next point, which is three quarter, again the point above this is on the curve, and so on. So there is a uh, countable set converging here, which is on the curve. So that 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 could give you the conjecture that this region is the truth. But it turns out that there are certain smaller, as well, polynomial curves. Uh, so the whole thing is very algebraic, uh, such that there is no point here. And then for a long time, and then I think from all times, Lotsi, Lotsi Lovas and uh, Miki Shimonovich proved that on a tiny interval here, it's really every point is above. And then the results like that were proved, and then it was a long story, and quite recently, maybe it was uh, 10 years ago, that Sasha Rasborov proved this whole conjecture. I don't tell you about this curve, I little bit. There is a formula. But it's perfectly characterized. And the best, best thing is that uh, he used uh, graph limit theory for that. Um, I will also tell you why graph limit theory is useful when you want to understand these things. So this is a story of success. And now we understand all possible algebraic inequalities between H densities and triangle densities. Um, there is a negative result, though, which is very upsetting. And the negative result is, I mean, this could be a nice program that let's take various projections and let's understand this, this projected shape. Uh, beautiful project, and I, I am sympathizing with this. But there is a negative result. Atomi Noreen, which says that an arbit if you if you consider the decision problem, decide if a certain inequality, which can be ex uh, expressed. Uh, in terms of a quantum graph, a polynomial on the graph limit space, TQW always holds, decide just this for every W. So obviously, uh, any such inequality or these curves can be formulated that way. Uh, if, you want, if you consider this decision problem, this is, uh, there is no Turing machine that does that. It's undecided. But there is no you, there is no hope for a general algorithm which, which produces you this shape. This shows that calculating inequalities between subgraph densities is, 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 is an art, basically. There are a bunch of methods, and I will list you the main methods, but in general it's an art. Maybe you can do it for edge, triangle, and Pfeffer's graph. Cool. But, 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 but you would, maybe you have to develop a new method, and a new method, and again a new method. It's a beautiful paper. It appeared in the gems. And then it was, uh, it was really a uh, strange thing for the subject, because we believed, actually, until this paper, that, that, this is, uh, that there is some general uh, anyways, uh, what are the three methods for subgraph densities that people use? I mean, currently, there, are, there may be other methods that I don't know of. So there are the three main methods. First method is this cauchy schwarz calculus. And this cauchy schwarz calculus uh, is that we call it uh, Lotsi reflection positivity. Using these reflection positivity inequalities, you can prove many inequalities. Uh, 
And then Rasporov developed the, the tool of, gra of flag algebras. But some of the two things turn out to be equivalent. It's another language. So some people like to think about this language, some people like to think about that language. But there is an, a formal equivalence between the two theories. Both are actually very powerful. You can, you can, you can prove inequalities. Um, there is a refinement of this cauchy schwarz calculus. It's basically uh, everything can be translated into maybe a very complicated use of iterative cauchy schwarz inequalities in this calculus, and you can prove many inequalities. I think the upper curve and the good number can be done with that. And there is a so-called variation principle. Variation principle, which has a version that Rosborough formulated, and he used that for his theorem, and there is a, another version of that that we formulate in terms of graph limit theory. You can prove it, you can formulate it in terms of graph forms. And this is really what you would expect from graph limit theory. Because why is graph limit theory good? Because it's a, it's a continuous closure of the set of all graphs, so that allows you to use variational principle. If you want to, for example, tell the minimum of a polynomial on the real line, what you do is you take the derivative of the polynomial and then you compute roots, right? Uh, but you can only do that if you uh, if you if you if you really have this analytic structure, and the graph limit language allows you to take variational principle. Uh, 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 this uh, this context allows you to take derivatives, and then uh, this very powerful tool comes into the picture. And Rosborov indeed used that uh, for this curve, for this curve. And the third thing is a so-called logarithmic calculus. And which uses, instead of the convexity of uh, the x squared function, basically cauchy uh calculus uses the convexity of the x squared function. Now, you can use the convexity of the entropy function or the concavity of the, of the log function. And based on those, uh, you can prove other inequalities. We have a paper on that with uh, Janet Lee, Chan Lee. And, uh, and also these other people use that. Uh, like this, these logarithmic uh, calculations uh, are uh, actually cover many new things and many old things this, that were proved in, 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 in various very special techniques. So actually most of the inequalities that are known and I know of uh, are fall in these three categories. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe there is an expert in, in this room who, who will say after my talk that he, she knows something that, which cannot be handled. I, I will be very interesting, and I'm very open to discussions, because, because this subject is very interesting. So, but anyway, so this is, this is a research topic that I would like to discuss with people. Um, so what, what other methods are available? Um, now, let me go back to these structural questions. Uh, this is as much as I want to, wanted to tell you about inequalities, but it's a very big subject. And now let's, let's uh, look at algebraic sets inside the graph limit space. In particular, already the question that there, what are the one-point algebraic sets? This is a super simple looking question. What are the one point sets, one point algebraic sets? I will reformulate that in a more human way. But, um, so in, in ordinary algebraic geometry, every single point is an algebraic set, right? So it's a finite dimensional space. It can be defined by finite many polynomials. Good. 
right? This X is a huge space. Intuitively, it's an infinite dimensional space. Still, for some strange reasons, for some strange reasons, there are points that are algebraic, but these are very rare and very special things. I mean, these are the points that can be described by finitely many subgraph entities. If you give, uh, like, let's say, uh, if you, comp if you, if, um, so another definition, we call these finitely flexible. And the definition is that W is finitely forcible if the following holds, if an other graphon satisfies that TU H1 is equal to TW uh, H1 and so on, THK. Uh, ah. H man U, sorry. Sorry about that. H man W, H K U, H K W. So if this holds for some finite set of graphs, which is a given finite set of graphs. Uh, now it turns out that if you if you do the definition with quantum graph is equivalent with the same as uh, graphs because you can take all the graphs as, that are components in the quantum graphs. X is the graph limit space. Oh, question mark. <laughs> so this implies that U is isomorphic to W. So if the, so basically it, it means that. Uh, these subgraph densities determine a unique graphon. Now, to appreciate this question, um, uh, let me go back to the analogy, which is my analogy is the moment problem from, from, from probability theory. What is the analogy of this? Take a random variable. What are the probability distributions that are uniquely determined by finitely many moments? that can be characterized by finitely many moments. Who knows the answer? Dalin knows the answer. Nobody asked? What is your guess? What is a natural answer to that question? It's the, sorry? This grid, like the probability distribution is finite, it's concentrated on finitely many real numbers. Those are the only ones. It's a nice exercise. I give you this as an exercise, okay? If you don't know this. Um, so what would be a natural conjecture for graphons? What are the graphons that I are described by finite in many moments like that? What is a natural conjecture? I'm curious if you come to the same conjecture that I came when, when, when we started to study this. What is the analogy of a random variable with finite distribution for graphons? Step functions, that's right. So here is a, a function uh, omega is divided into finitely many sets, and the value depends only on the set containing the x and y coordinates. Okay, these are called step functions. And for a long time, uh, we didn't know anything else. And on the other hand, uh, many examples supported that. I mean, it turned out eventually, uh, Lotzi Lovas and uh, Tesh Verati Shosh proved that these are all algebraic, right. these are all finitely forcible. And then, after many, many years, uh, with Lossi, we found examples that are not like that, and it turned out that uh, uh, they are defined on... Uh, most of examples that we found were defined on natural topological spaces. The, but this was already very crazy. To be honest, uh, this was already very shocking to me that there are algebraic sets, because these are really graphons that are described by finitely many numbers, and their structure can be very interesting. For example, uh, the graph one that Lotzi described, if you have the unit circle, and I mean the measure is normalized to the yeah, probability measure, and then you connect two points if their distance is at most one third, or this is an algebraic graph one. Or the simplest one that I can tell you is this threshold. 
graph on. This is the two variable function. And to finish my talk, I will continue from here, but to finish my talk, I put the, 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 the two equations which define this, if I find, you always forget. So this can be defined by the following thing. It's a quantum graph, but as I said, if you look at all the components and, uh, and those already defined, but let me uh, put the quantum graph version. This is the path of length 3 plus P edge squared, which is, as I noted, this is just P of P to disjoint edge edges. So this has to be equal to 0. And the other uh, equation is that P of the path of length 3 in W minus P of uh, the edge in W plus 1, 6 is equal to 0. And that's it. But so th these, are, these inequalities are given by quantum graphs, but I can, okay, then I, if I look at all the components and at the densities, obviously this graph satisfies those. So if I look at all the components here and I require the actual value here, then that will also force these equations to hold. So, so the, the, the so-called forcing family that we use is does the list of P3, square, edge density, and that's it. These are three subgraph densities, uh, because this is just the edge density squared. So, so three subgraph densities can actually define this. And uh, it also turns out that you can put here various monotonic polynomial curves, blah, blah. I will, next time I will go into the details here, because it's a, it's a very rich subject. But I think I, it's, it's enough for today. So, why don't you require to do all that? Well, the way of the use reflection positivity is there are many ways of using that, of course, uh, but one very useful way of doing that is that you take a so-called connection matrix. Here you list various labeled graphs. It's basically a multiplication table of labeled graphs. So you, you have a finite matrix, and the rows and the columns are indexed by k-labeled graphs. Let me give you an example. For example, 1, 2, 1, 2, one, two, one, two. And then I look at the multiplication table in a way that I delete the label nodes. So here I have a hexagon, here I have pentagon, pentagon, and so on. And then uh, it turns out that the formal uh, determinant of this ma this, these matrices uh, if I evaluate the densities of these graphs at the entries in a given W, then it leads to a semi-definite matrix. And so the determinant is positive. So if I compute the T in W, that's semi-definite. And from here I get the determinant is at least zero. So I get, for example, an equation that T, the four cycle density times the hexagon density is at least uh, the pentagon density squared. This is a typical use of... Uh, I mean, there is a... I don't know, there is... Maybe it's in Lutz's book which clarifies the equivalence how to translate certain things. So, 
uh, between the two languages. Yeah? Oh, do you mean the inequality with Limu? Uh, yes, there can be an inequality, and uh, the thing, the, the 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 example is that if here you have finer and finer random graphs with one and zero, here you have one half. Both converge to the one half function, and uh, here the delta one distance is separated from zero. Here it's zero. Actually, it's uh, that of and distance is one half. Yeah? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, um, Um, I don't really know that notion. I, I actually looked up in statistical physics and I was not sure. <laughs> okay, so let me give you a small history. So reflection positivity first came up in a different version in a paper by Lovas, Scriber, and Friedman. And uh, they used, the, the notion was slightly different and then uh, it didn't fit graph limit language so we modified it. Uh, basically, the modification was that in, in our notion we reduce multiple edges. And somehow the Lovas, the Lovas Scriber Friedman paper was uh, based on uh, motivation from statistical physics and uh, quantum field theory, and somehow they, they named it this way. And, uh, and I tried to figure out what the precise connection is, but I, I don't know. They named it that way, and, and what, this is a, a class of phenomena, and, and all these things are called reflection.